Thank you. Praise the Lord. Good morning. Praise the Lord. Good morning. Good to see you on another lovely morning that the Lord has given to each and every one of us. Praise the Lord. Sister Matheson, would you ask the Lord to bless our Sunday school for us, please? Our Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come to your house, to gather together as a body, Lord. We pray a blessing over the earth, Lord God. May our ears be open our hearts and be unto you. Bless the one that brings the word. Help us, O oh God, to take it in and apply it to our lives. So we ask it in our name. Amen. Thank you very much. Amen. So we are again uh, continuing on defending the faith in a secular world. And this morning we look at um, both God's love and his judgment. Um, and so both of these things uh, that actually uh, in our Christian life we should have absolutely no problem linking the two things together. Because if I ask you to consider... Um, what do we need in order to judge? Uh, I would say that the basic answer, answer is that we need standards, right? If you're going to judge anything, you need some kind of a standard, a guideline by which you are going to judge it. Um, so then the next question is, why do we have standards? Well, you could say it's so that we can judge, but that's kind of a circular kind of way of thinking. Um, but the reason we have standards tends to be because we want to care for one another, we want to make sure people are safe, uh, we want things to be done right, um, you know, there are standards with regards to building code, etc. And sometimes they, you know, you might think, well, they're just a pain, they're a problem, why do I have to do it that way? Well, it's because somebody has decided that's best for your safety and for the safety of others. So generally speaking, and I understand there are some exceptions to this, uh, that's why we would have standards, so that we can show our care and concern for one another. That care and concern for one another translates into love. Um, not the physical, sexual love, but the type of love that involves compassion and caring and wanting to make sure that everybody is okay. And so when we talk about love and judgment together, they actually do fit together. They require one another in order to be done right. The world um, and man, in man's thinking, mankind's thinking, sometimes will uh, try and put those two things together and when that happens in the natural we have a problem sometimes because emotions start to get mm, I was going to say in the way but emotions can cloud our judgment and the way that emotions cloud our judgment is that if we have an emotional tie with someone or we feel sorry for someone it's not that we don't judge. The problem is that we adjust the standard. You following? Okay. So if somebody says, you know, you know, thou shalt not steal, but then we see somebody who's in great poverty and they're starving, and then we say, well, in that situation, it's okay for them to do that. What's happened there is our emotion has gotten in the way because it's changing the standard. And so then what man does, what mankind does, is they adjust the standard based on their interpretation of the situation. So depending on what's happening and how it happens and who does it, and you know, you can add all kinds of different factors in there, they move the standard. And so for me, it might move this direction, and for you, it might move this direction. And, you know, and we see and historically, we see, depending on your culture, your race, skin color, the standard moves. It goes back and forth, depending on who's in that position of judging. And of course, since you and I and human beings don't live forever, there's a turnover in who's doing the judging. And therefore, there's a turnover in who is setting the standard. In effect, 
It results in minimal progress, minimal movement towards anything that's better because, you know, I might decide the standard is here. And as long as I'm alive, the standard is going to stay here. And then I pass on and somebody else comes on the scene and they move the standard to here. And so everything adjusts, all the laws, all the culture, everything adjusts, now the standard is to here. And then that person passes away, and then the standard moves again. You understand what I'm trying to say. And if this is the direction of progress, just picking that direction randomly, okay, we can go back and forth within a series of spaces over and over and over again, generation to generation to generation, never getting closer to the end goal. That's the problem with humanity, with man. And God foresaw that after how he designed us. And so he understood that would be the way that we would be able to comprehend and think because we can't see forever and we don't have all wisdom and we don't have all knowledge. So all of our decisions are based purely on what we know and understand today. There's really no other way to do it. We can't see into the future. If we could, we would all invest in stock and things that would be booming, right? Five years from now or next week or whatever. And, and uh, you know, we'd all be doing those kind of things. If I knew that there was some disease in my future that was gonna cause me sickness, then I would be planning, if I was wise, for that today, right? And to avoid that. And, and so, you know, because I can't do that, we do the best we can with what we know today. And God says, put your faith and trust in me. That's so important for us as God's people. And when we look at love and we look at judgment... We don't, as God's people, need to spend a lot of time, I don't think, I don't feel, debating that or considering that, because we all know God is love. And we all know that God is righteous, and that in His righteous love, there is no better judge than the Lord. But of course, this morning, we're here not to discuss that among us ourselves, our overall topic is to defend the faith in a secular world, in a world that doesn't understand or refuses to accept what we know. So it's important for us not to just be able to say to someone, well, God is love, because they're just going to slough that off. They're not going to accept that. If they don't know the Lord as their personal Savior, they don't know that God is love. They haven't experienced that. If they don't know who God is, as we talked about that a few weeks ago, then they're not going to understand what is this thing when you say that God is righteous. What do you, what do you mean by that? Where are you getting that from? You're just making that up. That's the way the world will respond. Bottom line is, of course, always that it requires faith and trust, and the scripture tells us that. But the best thing that you can do, and the best thing that I can do, is have an arsenal of Bible verses handy, or at least a few, to get that person whom you're speaking to, you know, into the scripture, reading what God has to say, um, while you pray with them and for them. Because it's God's Spirit, of course, that takes this and turns it from a textbook or a history book into living word. And that's what has an impact on each and every one of us. So this morning, I just want to lead you through a bit of a logical progression that you could perhaps use if you're talking to somebody and they look at God. And remember, we talked about the images of God and some would have this image of this a stern and cruel type of overlord um, that imposes his will on anyone and everyone 
and speaks and everything dies or speaks and everything grows. Um, you know, that image of God. Um, and we want to make sure that people understand truly who God is and how his love and judgment fit together. Okay? So the first piece, I think, is having that discussion with somebody. And I wrote down the question, can someone that loves you also judge you? That's the first question I think you have to ask. And in that conversation with someone, I think one needs to point out that sometimes human natural love can cloud judgment. And that leads then to this conversation about how God is different. Because God's judgment is not clouded. It does, the standard does not shift around. And, and that's so critical for you and so critical for me. The world standard is constantly shifting, like I said, based on who's making the decision. Let me just digress ever so slightly with an example. A disturbing, very disturbing example as far as I'm concerned and another indicator of who in the world is making the rules, that's the devil, and how you and I need to be aware, but then also need to use the weapons, and I spoke on Friday about really using the power that God has for his people, for his children, because that is our only offensive weapon. It's the best weapon. It's the one that will drive Satan out, and it's the one that will protect God's people, God's children, and future generations. That's my lead-in to the fact that I was reading yesterday about a decision that was made in Scotland. Now, a decision made in Scotland, you might say, well, that's far away, that's another country. But we have to also recognize that decisions made in countries in different places, they have a way of filtering around. Okay? And I'm not sharing this decision with you to filter it around to you in a positive way, but I do want you to be aware and see this as an example. Okay? What we're going to see here is a um, polluted love. I'm going to use that word. Um, and in that quote-unquote pretense of love, a decision has recently been made in Scotland that is resulting in some judgment. What's the decision? It was recently passed into Scottish law that school teachers may not and must not argue or disagree or even communicate with parents if a child as young as four indicates that they are a different gender. Now, just contemplate that for a moment. Right? I have a granddaughter who's now five. Brooklyn is five. And so somebody Brooklyn's age or younger could come up to their would-be kindergarten teacher and say to them that I'm no longer Brooklyn, I'm Bob, and um, I, I want you to call me he from now on. And... Scottish law, and understand that, it is now law, punishable because it is law. If the teacher were to disagree or suggest that the child, well, maybe you just want to think about that, or you're playing that you're Bob in this setting now where you want to play mom and dad and school teacher or whatever it happens to be, you know, and I'm sure all of us can reflect back on perhaps doing something like that. Um, but now the teacher, because someone, actually a group, have decided that this is good for children. Actually, the quote I read said that they believe now this will allow children to thrive, making this now a good thing. Convincing society that someone as young as four, because again, a, a quote in the article, saying that people can come out, discover their gender identity 
at any age. <laughs> Somehow they picked four as the threshold, I suppose. And I don't know. I've, and in my years as a teacher and as a principal, and being in contact with a lot of four-year-olds in kindergarten classes, it makes me kind of wonder if they can actually determine or fully even comprehend what that entails. See, that's an example of the world saying, because we love these children. We're going to make a law that now says adults cannot question. And like I said, can't even tell the parents that this is happening. And that's our world today. Happens to be across the ocean. But be on guard. It won't take too long before there are people, and they're probably already talking about it, in our own nation. Okay. See, all of these things, and just a, one little extra, the article goes on to explain, and I won't get into it, <coughs> but perhaps you can connect the dots, <coughs> That if we can convince society that a four-year-old is able to determine their gender preference, then how long after that will it be before we can convince society that a four-year-old can also tell you whether they want to engage in sexual activity? The idea being here, of course, in this article, that down the line we may be looking at the legalization of pedophilia, right? You see the connection, see? You, you have to, as Pastor John often says, you can't just look at what's happening today. We have to ask God for his vision to see where might this lead, okay? If you're saying a four-year-old has the power to make that decision, then what's to stop future law from saying a four-year-old can now also tell you whether he or she wants to engage in sexual activity with you. Is it that far of a leap? Unfortunately not. Law and so-called love are connected together. And the demons and demonic powers of the world today use that, skew that, twist that love. And we understand that. Satan's been doing that for a long time, right? The secular world will always throw out at you. If God is love, he wouldn't have allowed that to happen. We hear that, right? How can a God who says that he is love destroy all but Noah's family in a great flood? Imagine the carnage. Imagine the terror in the lives of those people who didn't make it into the ark. And yes, it would have been great. Tremendous, terrible thing. But God, who is love, is also the judge. These things link together. And the judgment happens when there is a standard. And when the standard is set by someone who loves you, even though you and I may not understand the standard at the time, the one who truly loves you only sets a standard that will help you, that will protect you, that will keep you. Okay? And in fact, when you stop and think about that, those who set the standard don't set it for themselves. They set it for the one that they are caring for. They set it for the one that they love. So when a parent says to the child, you're only six years old, you have to be in bed by I don't know, 7 p.m., 6.30, whatever time you decide. 8 o'clock, I don't know, can't remember. Okay? But whatever standard you set as a parent, you didn't set that for yourself, did you? You didn't go to bed at that time. 
But you, in love, knew that if that child didn't go to sleep by a set time, a standard, that there would be a consequence. Okay. And then, as a judge, you enforce the standard that you set. So when we talk about the Lord, and we talk about love and judgment, turn to Psalm 145. Now I've added some verses into the very big list that was provided for you. I would, as Pastor John has often encouraged us, Make sure you read those throughout the week, all right? But in all truth, uh, and also as Pastor, Pastor John and I have discussed, um, we use the Sunday school material as a guide. And, and sometimes I believe the Lord leads us in a different direction or uses that as a base, okay? So Psalm 145, verse 17 was not in the big list that you had, but I think and felt, and the Lord led, I believe, me to the place where this is important, right? The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. Now, the works include the judgment, but I wanted to make sure, and we, I think as God's people, need to keep telling the secular world that the Lord is righteous, okay? Not just that he is love, but that he is righteous. Now, when I say that, if you're like me, I need to make sure I understand what does righteous mean? Because chances are, maybe even you or I, and we might not want to admit this at times, <clears throat> it's a word we throw around, but we might not fully comprehend. And so it's good to have a couple extra words that we can use, especially if you're talking to somebody out there on the street. Righteous. What's it mean? Because if it's so important, the Lord is righteous, and I'm telling you that that links directly into the fact that the Lord is love. Let me give you some other words, okay? All of which describe God and his love. Okay? We could say, I'm just going to substitute. The Lord is good. The Lord is upright. The Lord is upstanding. The Lord is decent. The Lord is worthy. The Lord is ethical. The Lord is principled. The Lord has or is morally right, virtuous. All of those words talk about his righteousness. And if you need to sort of help yourself remember, just think about the word right, okay? And not right the way the world says, but right according to God's standard. That's important, okay? Because like I said, right now in Scotland, it's not right to do what I would feel is actually right. I mean, if a child came up to me and they're four years old and they say, you know, hey, Mr. B, you know, I know my name is Brooklyn, but I want you to call me Bob today. I wouldn't, like, you know, go off the deep end. I personally wouldn't make a really big deal out of it. Fine. You want to be called Bob today? I don't have a big issue with that. All right? Um, so, you know, because it's a child. If the child says, I want to, you know, wear my shoes backwards or whatever, you know, I'll try it for a day and see how it hurts your feet and, and whatever, you know. Chances are the next day they'll put them back on the other way. Chances are that tomorrow Brooklyn will want to be Brooklyn again. She won't even think about it, right? But when you say, now it's going to be illegal and you can't sort of do any of those things, now you've elevated it to a whole different level. That's not right. That's not righteous. Okay? So think about the word right and when we think about God. So it is this righteous, loving God that, of course, we serve. And other verses, please, you can write these down. Once you've sort of showed somebody, shown somebody 
You know, the Bible tells us that the Lord is righteous, of course. It also tells us God is love. And you probably have these verses somewhere, but 1 John 4 and 8. 1 John 4 and 8 says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. He that loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love. These verses are all um, deep. Let me use that word. They, 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 there's a lot wrapped up into them. Okay. He that loveth not knoweth not God. So now that brings the whole concept of knowing God into play. Okay. But the piece that we want to focus on here for this morning is just you can show people the Bible says, not I say, the Bible says that God is love. Psalm 86, Let's jump around just a little bit here. You can just write these down if you wish and look at them later or follow, that's no problem. Psalm 86 and verse 15, But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. Now you notice that verse doesn't use the word love, but I would say to you that everything that is describing God there is to me love. Somebody who quote unquote loves shows compassion, is gracious, is long suffering, is plenteous in mercy and truth. See, all of that defines this word that the world throws around, that love word. Okay. Because if God is love, then everything that God is subsequently is love. And so, you know, again, you look at all these words, and the world will say, well, I don't see a God showing compassion. See, they confuse the idea of compromise they think that compromise is what love is. And as God's people, the Bible teaches us that that's not the case. Love is not compromise. And we have generations, I'll say generations, but certainly at least one or more, that were convinced by culture, society, somebody, right? That the way you show love is to let your child do anything and everything they want. No rules! Do you see how do you see what Satan is always trying to do? He's always trying to supplant and move the standard. And he would love nothing better than to get rid of it completely. And so, you know, what's good for you is good for you, what's good for me is good for me. Really, that's a statement of no standards. And that leads to nothing but chaos, as far as I'm concerned, and as far as what I think we see in the scripture. Okay. That's not love. Letting your child do whatever they want, that's not love. Love is having standards, expectations and then following through on those things, okay? So, again, always coming back to that. One more verse there, and, and I want to go to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3, last chapter, 2 Peter, chapter 3 and verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I'm, I've added that verse because I really think that that one speaks to God's love. God doesn't want anyone to perish. As a parent, you want the best for your child. So the rules, the guidelines, the expectations are all designed 
to help your child grow up to be the very best that they can be. Okay. And you, you know, I mean a good parent, the majority of parents, I guess I would say, right? they don't want their child to perish. There's nothing harder for a parent than seeing something negative happen to their child. Many would say as parents, me instead. Take me instead, right? If you've ever lost a child or know somebody that's lost a child, a child has passed away. You know, those parents sometimes, you know, I'm quite, you know, I would say I haven't experienced that often, obviously, but I would think they would trade places. I've lived a good life. Why let that child, why have that child die and suffer? Okay, you know? That's the same compassion and long-suffering love that the Bible is speaking about here, right? He's not, what does it say, right? But is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, right? God doesn't want any to perish. And of course, and I didn't move to this example, but God sending his son is the ultimate demonstration of love. What is that? That's saying, I don't want anybody to perish. If there's a price that's going to be paid, God says, I'll pay it. Imagine that. Imagine that for a moment. Only to be rejected by so many. Which again, as a parent, is there really anything more difficult than when you know that what you are setting out as an expectation for your child isn't going to hurt them. It's for their good. And then the child rebels. Throws it back in your face. You don't love me. Right? And then they say all these things. Right? If you loved me, you would buy that for me. You'd let me go there. You wouldn't, you wouldn't worry if I did this or that and the other thing. See? Twisting it. And we have to always be on guard to the twisting. And I'm not suggesting we get into arguments. I'm again saying, come to the scripture. Well, thank you for your opinion. But here are some verses. Perhaps, if you'd like, I'll give them to you. You can read these. This is what I believe. Don't have to argue. Okay? But we do have to plant the seed. We do have to let the world know where we stand. Okay? So God in love sets standards. We could pull all kinds of examples, right? You can go to Exodus 20, where we find what? Ten commandments, right? What are they? They're standards. They're expectations. Are they there because God wanted to make your life miserable and mine miserable? No, they're there because God is love. And in love, he says to the children of Israel, I know you. Mm, you're going to get in trouble. The enemy's out there. There's lots of temptations. There are a lot of things out there that could get you, cause you a problem as a society. So here are ten commandments. These are things you must follow. And if you follow these things, you'll have success. Things will go well with you. You'll be blessed. You would think that people would be thrilled. But for some reason... Many are not, right? It's the old adage, the same example, the child that rebels against the parent. And it hurts the father. I believe it hurts the Lord. That God is grieved when he sees his children not following, you know, the gift that he's given. Really, it's a gift, right? That he's given in love from his experience from his wisdom, from his ability to see into the future, from beginning to end, God gives us this little glimpse, right? He knows the path. This is the thing. Stop and just think about this, right? My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow. God knows the way in love. He's going to lead us. All we have to do is follow. Simple. 
And yet, so many people find it so hard because of that rebellious nature that is there. Okay? But in Exodus 20, we see the Ten Commandments. I then wrote down, you know, for myself, Matthew 22, where Jesus takes the Ten Commandments and he condenses them down into the two, right? In Matthew 22, beginning at verse 36. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments have all the law and the prophets. In other words, Jesus was saying, that's the foundation. Okay, and there, there, in what I just read, that's another example of some simple words, very short, you know, when you say, you know, love thy neighbor as thyself. <laughs> that's easy to say. Now, stop and think what that really means. Consider. And then look a lot around you and see how those that don't serve God, that's definitely not what they're doing. Okay. If only the world could follow that commandment. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Wow, what a difference that would make. Would I ever have to lock my door? Would I ever have to worry about something being stolen from me? Would I ever have to worry about somebody hurting me, cheating me? See, all of these things, right? based on the fact that we wouldn't do that to ourselves. We don't like it when something like that happens to us. So, God definitely sets those standards. And then we know that He is the best judge. And He will judge. It comes with the territory. Flipping back to the parental example, right? If you decide and by the way, it's a decision. If you decide to be a parent, if you made that decision, if young people make that decision, along with the decision to be a parent come responsibilities. And one of those, or involved in those responsibilities, is the fact that you're going to have to be a judge. You're going to have to say to your child, no, or yes. See, both of those answers require judgment. Sometimes we think that judging is only negative. But it's not. Judging is both positive and negative. Judging is differentiating between, based on, a standard. I'm not completely colorblind, not even close. But I have trouble sometimes differentiating between small variations in color. I call upon my wife. I'm thinking right now about some of the testing I do for my tanks. Because I have to test the water. And then it tells me how much of a certain chemical is in the water based on the color that the little test vial changes into. Well, there's a, it's easy to tell if it's yellow, and dark blue. That's not a problem. But when yellow is 8, and then a little bit darker yellow is 8.2, and then a little bit closer to orange yellow is 8.4, and then a little bit more like orange is 8.6, then you get the idea. Then it's hard for me to differentiate, because okay, my eyes and brain set the standard for that. I'm sure you've all had that experience, right? You look at a color and you say, wow, look at that, it's orange. Somebody says, no, that's not orange. Or purple, purple, violet, fuchsia, you know, like we got all these different names for different, hat, you know, sort you know. And so somebody looks at it, I'll pick on men, we say, wow, look at that, it's purple. And then your wife says, no, 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 that's not purple, it's fuchsia or it's whatever, you know, and okay, if you say so. Different standard, that's all, okay? But God's standard is so perfect that God can differentiate. We waver. God doesn't. So in Matthew chapter 13, just in 
wrapping this up with you. Let's just look at, quickly at two examples of the Lord being the judge. And you can't avoid this. You could say, I don't believe it, but you can't avoid it. And in uh, Matthew 13, we'll just skip down to verse 41. Matthew 13, 41. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels. They shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Okay? What's that speaking of? God judging. See, God has no question, no doubt, when it says that they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend. In love, God has a perfect definition of what is offensive, what is contrary to his will. So you can't hide it behind a fancy suit, inside a nice haircut, inside a beautiful church. You can't hide it from the Lord because God sees through and through he knows what's rotten, and he knows what's not. And so that's an example of judgment. We understand that's going to happen. Notice there's that which is offensive, and then in verse 43, it talks about the righteous. Judging what is good and what is not. And of course, we have to turn in closing here to Revelation chapter 20. what we tend to speak of as the final judgment. Okay. And just uh, one verse there, Revelation 20 and verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their according to the things which were written in the books. Who writes things in the book? I'm thankful that it's not me. And I'm thankful that it's not you. And I'm thankful that it's not an elected official, somebody that, you know, in Canada, it looks like we're going to have another vote coming up in September. I'm thankful it's not any of those people. Because based on what's written in the book, there's going to be a decision made that is eternal. Eternal. Okay. God in love records your life and mine in the book. We have this image of a book. I would imagine it's God's mind. That he sees everything you've done, even today. He knows what you're thinking right now. Well, nothing hidden before the Lord. But he loves us. You know, in those times when you hear something, you see something, you squirm a little bit, I think that's God demonstrating his love. You feel that little bit of uncomfortableness? Well, I don't like when the pastor says that. Or I don't like when... You know, I'm listening to that missionary on the radio or watching on television or, or wherever. I don't like when I read that particular scripture verse because, ah, that's, you know, I got these relatives and maybe it's your kid and maybe it's your husband or maybe it's your wife. Or, and then that emotional thing happens, right? I think we all have to confess to the emotional piece. <laughs> But then we also have to, in truth, understand God's love, which involves emotion, does not mean moving the standard. And so we have to stay true to him, just as he is true to us. 
and see that both love and righteous judgment, I'm going to say, fit together. And my last thought, if you're born again, and you've given your life to the Lord, and you're doing the best you can, sincerely, because God is the one who sees that in your heart. You have nothing to worry about when it comes to the judgment. Nothing. Because for God's people to put their trust and faith in the Lord, that's the best place that we would ever want to be. We have to pray this morning for decisions the world is making, like the one I shared in Scotland. We have to pray this morning for places like Haiti. Another earthquake, maybe more aftershocks overnight while we were sleeping. Chaos. Terrible situation. A reporter yesterday said, the one piece that's sticking out in my mind, that the people don't trust anybody. Right? They don't have faith in their government there in Haiti because they have no they don't believe that it can do anything. Right? It's all corrupt. It's all and, and you know, and really quite frankly, you know, a lot of Canadians we tend to think the same. That's corrupt, this is corrupt, that you know, and if, if that gets to the overload point. And you trust no one, you have faith in nothing as far as what the world has. It's not a great way to live. But thanks be to God, we can put our faith and trust in Him. That allows you to sleep at night. That allows you to rest. That allows you to go out of your house and believe the Lord will take care of me. But if it's the time the Lord calls me home, then so be it. Why? Because God's the judge, he loves me, and he knows when it's the right time. And so if this afternoon the Lord calls me home, <clears throat> praise the Lord! It might be tough on you, tough on my family, whatever, and I'm not asking God to do that this afternoon. But what I'm just saying is, God knows best. And so, I don't need to worry about it. And that's what real love is all about. And that's what trusting God for his judgment is all about. And Lord bless you.